Good afternoon, Henry. How are you? Hey, very good to be with you, Jamie. It's it's well. a glad to hear it. It's a pleasure to talk to someone who's actually in the t- same time zone of me. It's been fascinating in this series of conversations which span the globe. So it's nice to have a fellow Londoner just down the road. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for making the time to join this series of sentientist conversations. I think a lot of your thinking and work and your recent book going to fit very nicely into our agenda. And the series of conversations are really focusing on the two deep philosophical questions, probably the most important to my mind. One is what's real and how should we choose what to believe? And the second one is what matters morally? What should we care about? What should we have compassion for? And I have an obvious bias here because I'm trying to popularize and build community around this really simple idea called sentientism, which says when it comes to choosing what to believe, we should use a naturalistic approach using evidence and reason. And when it comes to thinking about moral consideration and what matters morally, the clue is in the name. We should have compassion for all sentient beings, any being that can experience suffering or flourish. But I'm talking to people in these conversations that agree or disagree with that philosophy. So I'm yeah, fascinated to hear your personal story and where we get to on the conversation. Excellent. But before we it. dig into it, for people who don't know your work already, how would you best introduce yourself and your work? Great. I'm a journalist at the Financial Times. I, I write longer pieces for our weekend edition mainly, so interviews and features on all types of things. Just before this, I was doing British politics. But I, I studied environmental policy. I had a long interest in photography, which got me you know, to look at the natural world a lot. And I worked at a biodiversity think tank, actually, in, in Colombia and South America. And so I've always had this underlying sort of qu- question, these underlying questions about animals. And over the past few years, I've been able to go on a journey and to, to think about what it might mean to live in a, a society that took animals seriously, that looked at our actions through their eyes. Mm. And the result of that is, is a book called uh, How to Love Animals in a Human-Shaped World, which kind of is my answer to some of the questions about eating meat, uh, eating dairy, keeping pets, zoos, conservation, and how we get out of a world really of factory farms and looming extinction and to find something which actually aligns to our values. One of the nice things about this, and I think for me, I, I've always felt like I'm someone who enjoys both the beauty of animals, but the company of them and the, the thought that they're on our planet mm. as well. And so it hasn't really been about changing my values. I, I feel like that's, that's been the case. That's been constant for all my adult life and, and part of my childhood as well. But it's been about trying to align my behavior with them. So that's the journey I've been on. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And I think we'll come back to those themes because in many ways, when I describe sentientism to people and say, look, believe based on evidence and reason and care about all beings that can suffer, people would, most people would say, how is it even possible to disagree with that? It's just obvious common sense. And those values run through many people's day-to-day thinking. But as you say, behavior is a very different thing. And that's something we'll come back to as we think about how we can um, work through that paradox, or if not paradox, that that central challenge. And b- before we get on to those topics, the first of the two questions I like to ask is that one about what's real, because in many ways that links through to what matters morally. So it'd be interesting to know your story about how you grew up originally, whether that was in a more naturalistic, atheistic, scientific minded context, more religious, supernatural, something in between, and how your philosophy shifted, if it has, through your life to date. Yeah, I, I was brought up as an Anglican and I consider myself, I am an Anglican now. And, and I guess what's interesting for me is that the book, it doesn't, I didn't in the book go into the arguments really around how Christianity views animals or how it has views animals. Oh, there are fascinating stories in, uh, around that. Keith Thomas's book, uh, Man and the Natural World, which I, I don't know whether you know about the change in attitudes that there was, it was starting with priests and, but also all through all levels of society and the sort of, 16th, 17th and 18th century is absolutely fascinating just how the Christian tradition was interpreted differently. It's not, it wasn't at the forefront of my mind. I did play around with a couple of stories, what, like what does Noah's Ark really teach us? And I see actually the Noah's Ark idea is I think part of the reason why we find zoos instinctively logical. Oh yeah, we just keep the animals and then we'll release them and it will be fine one day. And actually, although I consider myself an Anglican, I don't think Noah's Ark is a particularly good model for conservation. <laughs> you know, I got to question some of these things. But, but Yeah, it's more like deliberate extinction and widespread genocide yeah, exactly. <laughs> every, everyone but one family someone put it much better that you know than me which is we think we're Noah but in fact we're the flood I really that really resonated with me but I think the, the book is called How to Love Animals and I guess that's because 
as indeed our environment secretary has said today, we can we are a nation of animal lovers, and so love is very much at the heart. And love is a Christian concept. So if, if there yeah. is a link between my upbringing and my religious beliefs and this book, it's in that. But it's not. That's not really how I've come at this. Yeah, yeah it's not that central to it. And it, it's interesting because I think both the sort of naturalistic scientific worldview can lead you to a sort of one that denigrates and justify the exploitation of animals in the same way as some religious views can as well, because the themes of dominion or we have souls, but animals don't. And there's all sorts of religious excuses for why we might be human exceptionalist and justify and excuse the harm of animals as well. I think absolutely. I think just in my, for the Financial Times, I interviewed the Archbishop of Canterbury a few weeks ago and I just, I prefer nothing. I hadn't planned to, but I said, oh, he was talking about getting a dog a few years ago when he became Archbishop. And I said, mm. well, do you believe that pets go to heaven? He said, I've never, oh, I've never been asked that. But he said, yes. And I, A, I was surprised he'd never been asked that. But A, it was nice to, it was nice to hear that, that, that clarification from, from the Archbishop. But I think people's, like, his answer there was about his experience of having dogs, yeah. having loved dogs. And I feel like our experiences of animals can change so much when we, you know, just see them close up and yeah. emotions. And, like, I think, how can you... and I think there is a parallel there. The way I'm framing sentientism is it explicitly naturalistic rather than religious. But again, you can take that context of I'm sentient, I experience things, I don't like suffering, pretty sure you don't either. In a way, morality is just the choice to care about that. And then taking that the next level and thinking across species and recognising that other species also suffer and flourish and feel joy and happiness and family connections and so on. And why shouldn't that matter too? And I think you can follow that path in a religious worldview as well. And there's some you know, very interesting organisations like the Animal Interfaith Alliance who are trying to do that work, whether in Christianity or Buddhism or uh, Judaism, and say, look, let's take these basic tenets around compassion and, you know, reverence for life and so on and, and reflect that in the way we think about animals. So it's quite interesting. There are parallel movements, I think, both in a naturalistic worldview and in a variety of religious worldviews that are trying to, you know, take the in-group, out-group stuff and suppress that within the human species and across and push the universal compassion story a bit more generously as well. Yeah, yeah I, um, I think it's fascinating. I, exactly. I, nobody has a monopoly on a wisdom or a compassion on this. Yeah. And Buddhism, which, you know, I think is an, Im immensely attractive as you're trying to think about well, how could we treat animals better? You look around, you look at Hinduism, you look at Jainism, you look at Buddhism. Yeah. And I, but I remember being in Mongolia and, and, and just saying to to or asking some Buddhist monks there, I said, this meat thing, because I, I was vegan by that stage, but I was saying, yeah, it just how do you deal with it? Because Mongolia is a country without much arable land. So yeah. you know, there aren't huge quantities of food and vegetables. And the, the culture is very much centered around livestock. And they were they were like, we've got we, <laughs> we find a way of uh, dealing with it. And another monk subsequently said to me that if you don't see the killing take place, then it's you know less of a sin. And it is so it's yeah. so funny because actually I think in the West, one of the problems is we don't see abattoirs, we don't see the meat industry, and therefore or we don't see factory farming. So we allow these things which aren't really in line with our values to, to keep occurring and keep growing. And yet from a Buddhist perspective, they had to find a, a way in Mongolia, these monks, of having something to eat on yeah. a, in a country very little arable land. So I, I think it's always nice to challenge one's conceptions that necessarily they have all the answers or that one idea can fit across. Yeah, agree, agree. Even the Dalai Lama isn't vegan and he's got no excuses. <laughs> but we'll come on to the, because in a way, this is the centre of the second question, the what matters morally. But just to finish up on the epistemological and the naturalistic side, I guess I've, one of the reasons why I'm framing sentientism in an explicitly naturalistic way, one is I think it's just a more convincing way to understand the world than a religious or a supernatural uh, or revealed way of understanding the world. And obviously arguments and discussions about that have gone on for many millennia and will continue. But there's a, there's a second almost distinct subject, which is that in some contexts, supernatural ways of thinking can actually cause moral and ethical issues as well, partly because sometimes something, whether it's a god or a church or an institution is promoted as being more important than the suffering of individual sentient beings. So that can cause the justification for needless suffering because it's mandated or because something is more important. And we might go back to the story of Abraham as a sort of classic, fairly disturbing example of that. But also because sometimes supernatural ways of thinking can lead to this sort of tribalistic in-group, out-group rationale. They can make compassion conditional or constrained. So it can be, okay, we have universal compassion, but actually it's compassion for the people in our camp, 
and only if you follow these following rules. And, and I think you, know, you and I both came from an Anglican background, which faces, I think, less of those types of challenges than many religions and certainly in many places around the world. But what's your view about how the intersection between a religious worldview and an ethical worldview can avoid some of those traps around ethics and morality? Yeah, you know what I really feel it's about the I feel like one of the appealing things about Anglicanism is that it focuses very much on kind of that underlying compassion and, and yeah. love rather than yeah, I find it difficult when we get into precise rules about what to eat or very literal interpretations. Whereas for me, I talk about it in the book, you go through a fish and you say, well, Does a fish feel pain? And then is the fishing industry humane? And is it minimizing stress to animals, etc.? Is it maintaining their populations? And that's a way of, and then you can put your values into action, as it were, by by asking some scientific questions. Yeah, I think I find it much more, much I find it much less satisfying just to come with some dogmatic view about or some inst- instruction about categorizing animals in certain ways, which yeah. doesn't respond to the science. I think I think that certainly is is an area where tradition is not that healthy for me. Or is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think it's similar within intrahuman ethics as well, because there are clearly some ways of religious thinking that are, you break this commandment and you will burn in hell for eternity. And to, to my mind, that's not a great ethical standard to set. But again, Anglicanism and that background takes a much softer line along those yeah. sorts of stories and backs away from that stuff. And in, in a way, has much more overlap with a sort of really a secular humanistic or secularly sentientist way of thinking when it comes to practical ethics than some other religious worldviews, which make a, you know, a much cleaner, deliberate break and can well, sometimes yeah, feel think- that they're more about obedience than compassion. Exactly. And in, in our lifetimes, the church here has been behind the curve on lots of things, whether yeah. it be, you know, the inclusion of women or the rights of gay couples, etc. So I think, it's a very flexible religion, yeah. or very easy to adapt, and it's still behind the times in lots of ways. So, yeah. I, but, I, I, but I think the underlying values, without me knowing it, have probably helped. In, it, it said they, I think they, the person I cite in the book is I, Iris Murdoch, and yeah. her idea of love being not just observing something, but really, you know, really focusing a, pr- a process of, of understanding that there's a, another being there, another individual. And, and that helped me more than any, any direct religious underpinning. But I think... Thinking in terms of love is probably an Anglican approach. Yeah, it's probably a, a, yeah, I, absolutely. I have you know plenty of criticisms of religious ways of thinking, but there is rich, deep, universal compassion that you know runs as a thread through all of them, and and that links nicely onto the second deep question, which is this: what matters morally? Story, because one of the challenges for pe- more naturalistic people like me is okay, if you don't have a religious worldview, why does anything matter at all? And I have a particular way of answering that, but it will be interesting to know. From your perspective, what is the grounding of morality? And is it something that goes back to that religious worldview, or is it more about empathy and compassion for others? And again, this will link directly to the, your recent work. It'll be really interesting to know your story about where you draw the boundaries as well, because it's reasonably easy. I think almost everyone has a com- compassion. The question is, what do we grant compassion or moral consideration to? So some people are have compassion, they love their mothers, it might be racist or sexist or homophobic, or might be part of a caste system that discriminates radically against other humans. Most humans, at least conceptually, will grant moral consideration to all humans, at least in concept, but then we'll get quite selective about non-human animals and species and so on in ways you've talked about in your book. So what was your journey in terms of the moral circle or moral consideration and why you draw the boundaries where you do? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think for a long time, I wanted animals to be okay because I like looking at them. Yeah. So it was a human-centered view. I wanted. I'm trying to. I definitely. I, I would have, in this in that in that mentality. I would definitely have thought of polar bears. E- yeah. Economists call this existence value. But yeah, yeah. You're never going to go and see a polar bear. But you like the idea it exists because you've seen a picture of one and the idea of it. But, you know, yeah. And so I think for a long time, I was looking at animals as something that benefited me, made me feel good. And I think actually, I would. I think there are two things that were really influential on me. One was seeing orangutans in in Borneo, and the most wonderful animals. The way they hang, especially as your especially as your joints get more fragile when you get older, you start looking at orangutans <laughs> yeah, absolutely. hanging from trees, and you think, "Oh my goodness, you are so well evolved!" But the way that they they do it so effortlessly, and just seeing them on a smaller and smaller 
a piece of territory as palm oil took over that that part of the world and and thinking like is this really the the mark we want to live this is this a world that we're deliberately creating or accidentally creating what if we paused what if we thought about it because here we have our some of our closest relatives and we can't find space for them and so that really helped me i think to see it from other animals point of view and the other was yuval noah harari's book yeah. sapiens which i think really because because of the amount of territory it covers it then the the part about factory farming is like a just a bolt from almost from the blue in the middle of it but just like very miserable animals and i'd never really forced myself to think about it and that i mean that, that in a way is incredible i was in my 30s when i read that book uh, i was still in my 30s but and I, i'd never forced myself to think about it in the way that he made me think about it in three or four pages so I, 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 I certainly owe him uh, a debt for, for that, for making me think. But I think the way he also just put human expansion in the process, in the context of thousands of years, makes you think, hold on, what happens if we don't draw a line? What yeah. happens if, as all projections show, we keep on consuming resources, territory, then who's left? Who, who, which of these magnificent animals, but also not so magnificent animals, but where where do they fit into our story? And I felt that was, you know, it's it's just not something we, we want to happen. We don't want elephants and giraffes to be minimized. We don't want the Amazon rainforest to collapse. And And so at some point we have to stop and think about it. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, oh, uh, one of the challenges that many people find is they go through a similar process to you in terms of you know, maybe apes or other mammals where we can identify them because you can talk about a scientific way of you know inferring sentience and you can talk about information processing architecture and common evolutionary history and analyzing behavior and communications or you can just look into the eyes of a puppy and viscerally you get a sense there is a, a being there with a perspective and it doesn't that matter but as you've written beautifully about there's a there's a massive gap between recognizing that on an emotional and then an intellectual level and then deciding uh, how to change your own behavior and your own decisions. How quickly did that flow through for you? Or was that painful, tricky, long drawn out process? I was reading Sapiens and I was staying at a and b I think it was over New Year uh, one year. And I, I was staying at a and b I was reading this. I was like, I got to go vegetarian. But unfortunately, right at that moment, I just ordered breakfast, which was not vegetarian. <laughs> so my first act as a it's too late, yeah. <laughs> to eat some smoked salmon, but it changed it. I think two, two surveys are really interesting on how we consider animals. One is that if you describe, I think a tree kangaroo was the animal they used, and they said, do you think this animal feels pain to yeah. a group of farmers? And uh, you know, certain percentage said uh, yes. And then they said, this is a tree kangaroo, which is regularly eaten in Papua New Guinea, or I can't remember the exact part of the world they used. Then the percentage of people who said that this animal could feel pain reduced. So the fact that we view these animals as edible or as eaten yeah. sort of reduces our mental view of them. On the flip side, if you ask people who they would rather save out of their pet and a, a human, quite a lot of people say their pet. And if you certainly if you say, I, I think, a foreign tourist, would you rather save your pet from a, a disaster or from drowning or a, a foreign tourist? Then more people say they're pets. Those actually, those that species barrier is less absolute than we think. And by the way, I'm not saying that you should necessarily save your pet rather than the foreign tourist. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think that's like, a firm recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Like, the nice thing about these things is that they don't. Well, in some ways, they don't occur, do they? In these circumstances, in other ways, in practice, they do because we spend lots of money on our pets' medical bills, which could save lives in various parts of the world. So we do yeah. take moral choices with how we spend money. But it, it feels to me that we really struggle against the barrier of tradition, that because we're told it's okay to eat these animals, because we're told this is what a farm is, we can't really bring ourselves to question that our society, our family, our, our parents would have allowed a world to exist where really abysmal farming practices happen, where extinction is a very real possibility for lots yeah. of species. Then I, th I think that's really hard. We have other concerns. And it's, there's an assumption that if it's happened like this, it must be, it must be correct and tolerable. And yeah. that, that's, I think, where, that's why people draw the line so narrowly. Often. And selectively, and often in weird ways, as you say, I mean, the default you know, human stance is conceptually to can care about all humans, although with variations, of course, to care about companion animals deeply, 
to care about charismatic wild animals, mostly because for human pleasure and we enjoy watching the nature documentaries and generic senses of the value of biodiversity. But most wild animals, the non-charismatic stuff, and most farmed animals in practical terms get zero moral consideration. Although even there, there is there's a latent moral consideration that just isn't carried through into practical terms because of those social norms and traditions and the way we're brought up. And it would be good to come back to that because in a way that's almost the central challenge when we're thinking about how can we make the world a better place for human and non-human animals because it's less feels like less of a logical problem or less of a moral argument problem and more of a weird human psychology problem to, to face. So it'd be interesting to come back to your thoughts on that. But before we move off from this question of what does matter morally, would you say that it is uh, sentience, the capacity to suffer, as Bentham would put it, or I guess the taxonomy of animal or something else that you use to set the boundary? Yeah, I think, I think sentience is a pretty good starting point. So in my book, I talk about muscle farming. And I yes. say, well, look, muscles, we, I think it, in general, it's right to assume that we will discover more about animals' cognitive abilities because we have simply been going, going forward so rapidly in terms yeah. of what we now appreciate. Our understanding, yeah. If you come to muscles and there are, there are quite, there's very little evidence on them, but there's quite good evolutionary reasons why they wouldn't really be able to feel pain. And they seem to have an alternative mechanism if pain is a way of effectively avoiding harm or an evolved way of evolved way of sensing threats and reacting to them muscles what they have is the ability to close their shells and the hard the hard shell that's their way of doing that and it's not necessarily built around pain and around sentience and they wouldn't seem to have the nervous system so then i think well look they're in they're mollusks like octopuses but obviously a very different branch and so i would i don't feel so concerned i think insects is a really the scientists is a really interesting question the, the amount that they the scientists have discovered around honeybees and the complexity in a really obviously small bodied animal incredible and then when you think about insect farming i think there are issues and you certainly you think about the use of billions of bees for pollination of nuts and fruits in california i i think that does raise concerns and so yeah but but i didn't in the book i didn't really talk about that because i think that's a journey people can go on once once yeah. they've actually come to terms with the way we farm chickens, the way yeah. we turn pigs. The core okay. obvious cases, yeah. yeah. And that's, what, that's one of the things I find fascinating and deeply frustrating about all of this topic is that people are inexorably drawn to the edge cases and partly because they're intellectually interesting, right? They're interesting philosophical challenges and scientific challenges. And I feel that pull too. But many people are pulled towards the edge cases because they don't want to engage with the central case, right? The central really obvious screaming out problems. And I'd, I'd echo your view in a sense in that, in that I'm very confident that sentience is the right characteristic for moral inclusion. I think anything that has the capacity to suffer warrants moral consideration. But I'm, I don't know where that boundary is. And given the naturalism of sentientism, I think we should keep an open mind, follow the evidence, use the developing science and have provisional probabilistic views about where sentience is. So there are sentientists who are confident enough about muscles that they're comfortable eating them. And there are many others that say, uh, maybe, but I still give them the benefit of the doubt and I prefer to be prudent. And I think it's fine to be open about those choices. I think a naturalistic approach means we should have uncertainty about our knowledge about anything, really. But I, but I, 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 tried to, I did try and buy some muscles the, the other day, and but then I thought, well, I don't really need any muscles. And yeah, yeah. Like, even though I sort of, you know, so why, do I, why don't I just leave them on the supermarket shelf? So it is a funny one. Well, if I, yeah, certainly if I were on Mongolia and they were my only food, I mean, Mongolia being landlocked, yeah. but, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> they might not be that fresh, but. Yeah. No, I, I mean, what I feel really sad, the other day I was next to a fishmonger and yeah, lots of dead fish on the ice and also a lobster with claws clamp, clamped up but alive on the ice. I feel like we don't really have to focus on some of the theoretical issues. Surely no. people can see for themselves yeah. that that is an animal. That is a conscious animal being having the last so moment. So obvious. Yeah. yeah, it's so obvious. And, and also I said to the... I asked the fishmonger, I said, how do most of these fish get killed? And I just seeing what the response was. And he said, oh yeah, most of them just get suffocated on the ice. Horrible. And yeah. it's, I think there is a real, and, and yet the fishmonger's view will be, this is how people want their food presented. Yeah. And so it, I think really an ethical consumer can make a huge difference. If say you're not ready to give up seafood, you can still say, look, I'm going to buy this lobster, but please, I don't need it to be alive. I, I, I really feel like there was a, there's a, a real failure to question practices that yeah, renders some of this nice academic debate not not obsolete, but secondary. Yeah. 
I agree. I totally agree. The core case is what's most important, both in because it's bloody obvious, but also because of the sheer scale of it. There aren't many situations where you are going to be on a desert island with only a chicken next to you. And what do you do as a vegan? That Fine. <laughs> Yeah. We can talk about we can talk about that if you really want to, but can't we talk about animal farming and factory farming? We'll throw it back to yeah. Good. I mean, it, of course, then you can throw it back to a meat eater and say, look, if you were on desert island and it was only your pet, what do you do? Do you yeah, yeah, what stage do you absolutely uh, uh, Fido? We all have these limits, of course, of course, yeah. And, and we shouldn't pretend we have perfect answers to the difficult trolley problems either. But but there are some things that are such obvious, clear win wins that that's where I think we should focus. But there's an interesting, a few interesting ways of challenging this sort of focus on sentience. And one obvious one we've talked about a lot already is saying, look, you're going too far with a sentiocentric view, right? Actually, only humans should matter or only humans in a subset. And you and I, I think would disagree with that. But there's also another view which says, look, sentientism or sentiocentrism doesn't go far enough. And some people will say, look, we should go to biocentrism where everything living has intrinsic value, trees and plants and sea sponges and so on. And some people would go even further and say, look, we should have an ecocentric view, which looks at ecosystems and biodiversity and species, and maybe Earth as a planetary system of Gaia that has its own intrinsic value and rivers and rocks and you know, even things that, which aren't living have intrinsic value because they're part of an embedded ecosystem. So I'm interested in your view on those angles. Is there a justification for thinking morally or even more broadly than can they suffer? Yeah, I think I am keen to, to sort of emphasise there is something really special about consciousness, even if we struggle to define and prove consciousness. Yeah. There is re- something really special about the lives that animals lead, the choices they make, the connections they make. Now, Their experiences, the fact they can have experiences, yeah. Yeah, I, when I, quite often there, there are birds outside the window and you see the decisions they're making and the distances they're travelling and, and all, all these things. I, I really think there is something separate from that to the, uh, compared to the hedge across the road, which is beautiful and important, but, you know, it's not, it's, it is not existing in the same way. So I, I'm fascinated by the way that trees communicate through fungal networks under the soil. I think that's wonderful. And I think actually it leads you to the same conclusion because animals need healthy ecosystems, they need plants. Yeah. But I, I think certainly in terms of practical implications, look, to be honest, you need healthy ecosystems, which may mean protecting rivers and maybe protecting particular trees. But if we get to a stage where we can't cut down trees then, or, or cut off branches, then I think obviously we're going to get very hungry. Uh, yeah. I think the choices I was, I'm interested in making right now are about you know, how do we eat in a sustainable and ethical way? And I don't think focusing on, on the undoubtedly amazing abilities of trees, but I don't think that particularly helps me in those decisions. And I think we should focus on what we have in common, really, which is, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm with you. Again, I'm, I'm open-minded about where that boundary of sentience is. And if you find new evidence that trees might be sentient, then I would shift my moral perspective. But so far, I've seen nothing that indicates they have the information processing architecture, the evolutionary history or the behavior that would warrant sentience. They can have complex behaviors and interaction and even communication, but I haven't seen anything yet that indicates they have any basis for sentience whatsoever. But putting that one to one side, I think you're right. Even with a view that's very focused on sentience and consciousness, as mine is, still leads you to, I think, a very rich concern for the environment and climate change and everything going on around us. But the, the reason I'm concerned about the planetary systems and ecosystems and climate change and pollution is because of their impact on the sentient beings. It's not because I, I'm worried about whether the river has an experience about how it flows or whether the river mm. is polluted. The reason yeah. I'm worried about river pollution is because of the fish and because of the humans and because of the sentient beings around it. And I, it leads, leads me to one of those other frustrations, which I think you echo in some of your writing in that I'm very comfortable, you know, if people want to go beyond sentient beings in moral consideration, I, I don't mind that as long as you don't forget any of the beings that are very obviously sentient. And it feels to me like the, the mainstream environmental movement absolutely does that. So it moves from a, you know, a, a perspective about human ethics and human rights. Maybe it sees the threats to humans from pollution and climate change and environmental destruction and jumps radically to a sort of ecocentric view about the planet as Gaia and ecosystems and biodiversity and species and so on, at the same time as still excluding 
many trillions of very obviously sentient beings, both in the wild and in farms, from moral consideration. So you can get and lead to this environmental default stance that is much more concerned about species and biosystems and diversity that can't suffer and has practically zero consideration for very obviously sentient beings that can. And again, it feels like that sort of extension to a very, what could be a very gen- generous ecocentric way of thinking is really just another reflection of an anthropocentric human view about we like wild animals because they look pretty and we want a nice environment because it feels pretty and supports us. But there isn't really an ethical concern for individual sentient beings outside of you know, yeah, I, our I, narrow I, circles I, of concern. I, it's frustrating, but I that's think, my rant um, over. No, I, th- I, I, I think you put your finger on, on something which actually leads to some, some very tricky areas. And undoubtedly, I think the real thing that conservationists and people concerned about animal sentience and animal interests have in common is that factory farming is a complete disaster, yeah. you know, and livestock takes up you know, more than 70% of the... Agricultural land, yeah. Agricultural land, sorry, and, and produces less than 40% of our, you know, protein. So 18% of the calories, it's breathtakingly inefficient. And so you're thinking, here's a real win-win from both these movements' point of view. But it really, and so I I think if you focus on that and then focus on protecting natural ecosystems and and reducing climate change and other pollution, then, okay, you've got a lot in common. There are some really tricky issues around Mm. invasive species where, and indeed controlling numbers where predators aren't here, such as deer in the UK, issues around hunting in Africa and elsewhere, which is very unpopular with animal activists, but defended by conservationists. And I think there is the basic difference between a conservationist concerned by the species and by the ecosystem and an animal activist concerned about, I think these aren't as reconcilable as I perhaps I thought at the beginning of my book research. Agree. At the same yeah. time, I think we do have to remember that they are secondary issues. And I, I, But I think actually one of the areas where there is some coming together is fishing. And whenever I was reading about fishing, it was, it, you know, even the critique from those like Greenpeace was around still using the language of if we fish more sustainably, then there'll be yeah. more fish in the long term. It's about the population levels for food. Yeah, exactly. And so it was all about managing a resource sustainably yeah. as if yeah. it were... Um, a forest for timber. Yeah. And I felt that that language sat quite uncomfortably w- with me, given, I think, firstly, given the reality that this is an ecosystem with quite complex interactions between different species, and it's not as simple as maximizing one stock, with, especially with the knowledge we have and mm-hmm. with a very large amount of illegal fishing as well. I think our, our um, ability to calculate the fish stock's capacity and sustainable yield is not as great as we think. But I also think it, it just profoundly underestimated fish as animals. I think that had, if you look at something like sea spiracy, it brings together those two threads of the thinking around sentience and indeed around fish stocks. And I think in quite a, a helpful way, and they point in the same direction, which yeah. is we'd like to do much less of it. Now, of course, you, you then get into tricky areas about, well, look, is the small scale fishing that everybody likes, is that actually minimizing pain or is that using less? Actually, maybe, maybe that's using crueler methods in some ways. So I think... It, it's not as it's not always as easy as we think, yeah. but I think it's great that fish can be spoken of as animals and not just as resources. To I agree, and I think even on on a lot of those challenging topics, invasive species and hunting and wild animal suffering and so on, and the need and the fact that for certain types of communities around the world, some of them have a much more of a survival need for animal farming and fishing than you know you or I do with the supermarket around the corner. So there are challenges there. And in a way, this sentientism philosophy I'm um, trying to popularise, it doesn't answer all of those questions at all. And people will continue to fight over what's the right answer there. It just says, at the very least, we need to have moral consideration for each of the sentient individuals in that situation. It doesn't mean there's a perfect answer. It doesn't mean we won't need to cause harm or even kill, but let's at least have moral consideration for every one of the entities in that situation. And what that might lead us to do sometimes is regretfully to carry on as we are, because there, maybe there is no better solution. Or it might lead us to just look with fresh eyes at some of these challenging issues and maybe fencing or contraceptive darting might be better than culling or whatever it is. But just that shift of perspective at least gives us a half a chance of finding a more compassionate solution. But let's not be naive. 
there are going to be, as with human ethics, sometimes there just are really bloody awful, difficult problems and there isn't a perfect answer. But, no, but I, think, I think we're in a much better... Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think you, you covered it exactly um, as I would on that. And, but certainly we're not, we're not like Darwin going around and just hitting stuff with a hammer just, <laughs> just so that I can take this back to London. Or indeed, like, like David Attenborough at the beginning of his career, just taking whatever wild animal to, back home to Richmond or yeah. back home to viewers so, so people could see it on a table. Pin I mean, on I think, a wall. Yeah. So I think we have come a long way. And actually, David Attenborough is someone who in his own lifetime will have seen that you know, shift from let's go out as if it were um, a supermarket or some kind of Amazon yeah. warehouse where we can go and pick animals and, and present them back home. And, and let's actually respect them where they are. I think, and actually going back to the sort of ecocentrism, I think having some idea of what, what a functioning ecosystem looks like, even though ecosystems change and adapt, but that that can really help us see the order of animals within it, you know, the yeah. place of animals with it. And yesterday I was looking at pictures of a, a giraffes arriving at Edinburgh Zoo. And I just feel these giraffes do not belong in a no doubt very expensive shed. And they don't they, they have a view apparently of parts of Edinburgh. They don't, you know, think about the climate, <laughs> thinking about the ecosystem. We were clearly missing an idea of if those images are attractive to, to British news watchers of giraffes being housed on concrete floors, if that's attractive, then we've lost our, our, our sense of what, what an ecosystem for giraffes looks like and yeah. where they might like to live. So Agreed. I think, I think they can be compatible. Uh, uh, and I think there's a, couple of, there's a couple of useful tests that, again, won't give us a perfect answer, but can be a useful check on the way we think about non-human animals. And the first one is genuinely try and take their perspective. We can't do that perfectly. I can't, we can't do it perfectly within hum, with humans as well. But in the same way as with human ethics, you try and take the perspective of the other. And I think that's important to try and do across the species boundary as well. And the second thing, which is maybe more contentious, but I think is interesting is even if you don't think humans and non-human sentient beings warrant the same moral consideration, or even if you think humans are for whichever reason are more important, maybe their sentience is richer or they have higher capabilities or whatever, as long as they both have some moral consideration in your mind, it's an interesting thought experiment to take the way we think about non-human animals and say, would that work for human animals? And quite often, the answer is a shocking, sickening, oh my God, of course not. And that's not normally because we just offer different degrees of moral consideration. It's because we're using a completely different ethical system that in practical terms grants zero moral consideration to the non-human. So I find that quite an interesting check so when people are talking but take the example of deer culling for example so i I did think about this i thought look there are lots of reasons at the ecosystem level in scotland they kill over a hundred thousand deer a year just and they have no predators because we wipe them out well there's another reason why they have so many because if you look in the pdf document that is the guide for setting up a deer farm or a deer estate it includes guidance about how to breed so there's yeah. another reason why there's overpopulation yeah. is because the businesses up there are deliberately helping increase breeding we- because as someone who's well-versed in economics, you understand the incentives yeah. from... Yeah, I, I absolutely agree that the, yeah, the bodies who should be thinking sustainably about the land are, are not. But then if you apply the culling to, to humans and you think, what if there were a super species which came to earth and said, is any population out of control? We'll start gunning down humans. And suddenly the idea of culling doesn't seem so attractive, but neither, of course, does sterilization or contraception. Or so. I think in some ways you have to realize that humans are in a unique position and yeah. we're not, we, we don't necessarily need to, we, we don't need to eat other animals on most parts of, in most yeah. parts of the world. Yeah. And we uh, are also not at risk, really, of being prey to other animals. So th- there is a kind yeah. of very strange position. But I think you can at least do the check. I, I yeah. agree. And yeah. I think and certainly when it comes to farming conditions, I think, is this a life living as yeah. a pig, even on a decent pig farm when you get to go outside? Is this yeah. a life where you can't really go beyond the next hill or you can't make your decision about who you socialise with? I came to the view working on a pig farm for this book. Actually, no, that's not existence. Yeah, uh, you saw a, it firsthand. The way. And one of the other interesting areas where I did this check in a uh, Twitter conversation recently, which is, as you can imagine, a fun place to be a vegan atheist. But, but we had the conversation about the logic of the larder, which you might have heard before, which is if we breed an animal, give it a nice life on a free range farm, let it live happily with its family and then painlessly euthanize it. Isn't that a net positive because we've given it a, a life worth living and a painless death? Now, we can put to one side whether or not 
that reflects animal farming in any way, shape or form, because it doesn't. But the individual on Twitter did actually bite the bullet and say, yes, that would also justify farming human toddlers for food. Now, not many people will go there if they've had a net positive life and they're euthanized painlessly. And you know, why not? So I think, yeah, it's a, it may, yeah. Be, may seem a silly thing, but I think it's an interesting check. And then to examine, okay, why, why is that difference? But yeah, or, or at least it, it might just by having as many children as possible because those children have a right to exist and a benefit of existing and don't yeah, have a, exactly. um, a duty to bring. I, I, I agree. These things, these things basically, they have limits, these yeah. comparisons. But I, I find them, I find it interesting that people are willing to have the debate and they want to have the debate. And if, if you go down to a, a, a cafe now and, and get into a, a conversation about it, people have views. They have, that's exciting, I think, because that means they're, they, they can be changed. Yeah, agree. And, and and that leads nicely onto the final question I'd like to ask, which is about the future. Because on the one hand, I mean, you put it beautifully in your FT article recently, you said love for animals is one of society's core values. Rational thinking is another, right? So on that basis, as you say, in a way, most humans already agree with us about loving animals, caring for animals, not wanting to needlessly cause harm. And yet we do what we do. So if we put all the thought experiments and the edge cases to one side and just think about farming, factory farming, fishing at scale, how do you think about one, what a more utopian, more compassionate future might look like if you want to get a bit sci-fi, but also practically, how can we drive that change given this sort of weird network of social norms that nearly everyone on the planet is trapped into? And I'm particularly interested in, given your work, the role that you think journalism and language might play in shifting social norms, how much of it is about moral argument versus making the transition easy? What, how do you think about the future and how we might be able to improve it for us and animal friends? So the book I wrote was partly inspired by having kids around and having yeah. kids and seeing their storybooks and asking myself, does this reflect the reality of animals? And am I, you know, and I decided ultimately I felt very uneasy that my and my kids were growing up with these lovely visions of lions and pandas and zebras and wolves and other animals and, and also farmyards, which don't exist in, in the form they did in the books. And, that, and they were getting the sense that we knew how to live alongside animals when, in fact, we don't really have. Yeah. Uh, um, and you might be interested in one of my previous guests called Linda Korenbokas has written a brilliant academic paper, but it's very readable, called The Peppa Pig Paradox. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm sure that you know, played I, in. I, I, yes, I, I know that paper. And Peppa Pig is a toddler in, in, a, in pig form. But there are lots of, if I look at Beatrix Potter or something, yeah. it's really interesting the, sort of the, the blurring of boundaries because there, there's a lot of actual death and the actual lives of badgers and foxes and mice and, and rabbits and that. That's all very, sorry, that's a, a nice aside. But I feel really optimistic that change has to happen because we simply can't feed ourselves in this way and avoid a disastrous outcome for the climate and for biodiversity. We almost feel have no like, choice. The, yeah, that doesn't mean that we can't leave it too late and be in a much worse situation than we should be. But I feel, yeah. I feel like the evidence all points one way. And you, you do see lots of attempts to push back and to say that this meat is sustainable in this way or this form of farming could be slightly better. But I you know, almost invariably find that if a solution... Uh, put by the farming industry is good for animal welfare, then it actually requires more land or more resources. And if it's good at reducing carbon emissions, it might require animals to be kept in indoors or yeah. in uh, more intensive conditions. Arguably, factory farming has less of an environmental impact than some free range, so in terms of land yeah. use and pollution. and yeah. So the way of bringing those together is to cut it out. And so yeah. I, I yeah. really look forward to a vision. And I think I, I've, I've tried really hard in my book not to make this a problem about other people. So it's not a book about what's happening in Asia, particularly. It's a book really about what can we do as people who have, you know, have consumed to continue to consume more meat than almost anyone yeah. around the world in the yeah. West, and have actually spread the love of meat throughout the 19th century. That was a, a, a sort of British inspiration to places like yeah. you know, here in Japan. So I think we another you know, we colonial thing we've pushed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just to go back to why, so I started off by saying it was a book about my kids, but I really believe that individual change is, is really crucial at this stage. We're at a moment where obviously investors are interested in alternative meats, where government are looking to have better incentives for farming and biodiversity. Sorry? Carbon pricing. Carbon pricing and all those things. But 
for example, to really clamp down on factory farming, you would need a much greater number of people to have rejected that system, not just to be uneasy, as I think yeah. people are now, but to have said, look, actually, I don't need a part of it. And I think of it like smoking. When 60% of the population smoked, it was very hard to ban smoking in pubs. But by the time you got to the 90s and 2000s, this was a viable strategy because not many people partaked in smoking in pubs and they thought it was a nuisance and they thought it was unhealthy yeah. and bad for, for their way of life. So I think we have to get to a point. And it's so hard to condemn a system that you're part of on a daily basis as well. It's Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I think we need to make the transition much easier, but I think there really is a reward, not just on a personal level of feeling happy with what you eat and happy with your impact on the planet. But I think that if you want political change, it does start with personal change. Opting out of meat and dairy is, is the best way, I think, to drive forward change in society because it gives freedom to policymakers, to people who run schools, people who run cafes to say, look, I'm going to shift this way. I'm going to make my whole menu plant-based. I'm going to, off- I'm going to make sure that vegan food is the default in our institution. And they, that can only happen with individual change, I feel. So yeah. I, I don't believe in this argument, which is sometimes put forward by the left, that only corporations and government can change things. I believe that they yeah. respond to incentives, which are set often by individuals. Completely agree. And I'm sympathetic to the systemic stuff because, of course, there's a lot of power there and there's a lot of influence and it's you can be sceptical about your own influence as an individual. But I see a lot of that systemic change narrative really being motivated by oh, that's great because it gives me an excuse not to make the change. And you ask questions about, okay, you're against this system. Where do you think the money comes from to support this system and to drive it and to make it work and to put the incentives into it? And yeah, it's coming from our individual decisions. In the same way as if you fundamentally disagreed with a political party, you wouldn't donate to them and say, my personal choice makes no difference. If you're against this factory farming system, why would you buy from it when you just don't need to? So there's a lot of strange behavior there. So I'd agree. I think, fine, our individual choices might have a small impact, but they do still have an impact, right? That's how economics works, right? Every choice we make sends a little signal to keep doing what you're doing, buy more of this, do that through the supply chain, up back yeah, to the slaughterhouse quite- of the fishing market. And also every one of those institutional changes is comprised of individuals, right? We're not just consumers, we're leaders and managers and shareholders and employees and letter writers and voters we can there ultimately every one of those systems comprises individuals too so you can you don't just have to take the consumption decision you can still influence those systems as well why not, why not just do both yeah i really feel that people who run restaurants run cafes they're not desperate to sell milk you go in and say if you got uh, oat milk if you go in and ask that two times and the third time they're going to have bought in oat milk because they're going to realize you want it it's not people are less ideologically committed often and even when I spoke to farmers, farmers would always say, we produce it in this way because people expect it. They expect it at a price. And you, we shouldn't allow ourselves to get caught in the circularity of farmers saying, oh, consumers want it, therefore we have to produce it. And consumers saying, well, farmers need us to buy it because otherwise they'd be out of a job. Yeah. The fact is you can break the circle and there is a, there is a different future on both sides. There are, there are perfectly good alternatives, both for farmers and for um, consumers. So I, I really believe that, yeah. you can, you know, that people are willing to have this conversation in a way they weren't five, 10 years ago. So what, like, what a great time to have it in a non-evangelical, but just uh, practical way. Agree. And there's some, some of the initiatives I think are most powerful are the ones that are actually working with farmers to help them transition. There's, I think, stock-free farming in Scotland. There's an initiative in Sweden that's EU funded. There's the Rancher Advocacy Programme and Miyoko's Creamery. And these are organizations actually going to work with animal farmers and saying, look, can we help you transition to find a less harmful, more environmentally sustainable business model? Because we've seen this problem where transitions happen with industries before, where the people involved in those industries just get left on the left on the sidelines and to hey, deal I with work themselves. In yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You will know these stories much better than me. But there are ways of driving what people call a just transition, which I, a phrase I really like because it means one just transition, let's just do it. Yeah. But it also means do it in a just way, which means let's take the subsidies and you know all the other things that perpetuate these systems and divert them to help with a transition that doesn't just care about all the non-human animals that are being chewed up, 
it actually cares about the families and the communities that are currently involved in these industries and help them help them shift. It's eminently possible. It's a it's an obvious win win. We can put the trolley problems to one side. There's some you know obvious win win scenarios in the face. And I think you're right. Things are shifting. Is it does feel like this while the graphs of animal suffering and slaughter still keep going up globally. It does feel like in certain cultures there's a genuine shift in people's openness to this way of thinking and some practical thinking about better ways forward. Yeah. And I, I saw a lovely quote by Henry Thoreau the other day, which from his journal, which was uh, said, do the things which lie nearest to you, but which are difficult. And mm. I feel like we have lots of, you don't have to do it all in one go. You don't have to reach for the farthest place. You don't have to jump to veganism or go and, you know, protect the Amazon in, in one go. Around us all the time are choices which are a little bit hard, but which are possible. Mm. And whether that's ordering vegan food, or just displaying a bit more compassion to, to animals in, in whatever way. I, 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 you know, learning about them or having conversations with our children about them, I, I feel like we should take those opportunities when they present themselves and realize it's a journey rather than some kind of absolute perfectionist manual yeah. that everyone has to obey, which it isn't because we don't have all the answers. Are you suggesting that vegans like us aren't ethically pure and perfect <laughs> in every respect? Uh, I totally agree. And that sort of image of purity and perfection, and I think puts people off, right? No one's perfect. Even a completely plant-based diet still causes some harm and suffering. Like there's no one's got to the end of the journey, but at the same time, being on a journey isn't an excuse to stop. We can, and there are all sorts of greenwashing and ethical washing ways that are convenient laybys that people can stop in, I'm concerned about. But I think it is a question of just don't worry about being perfect. Just think about what you can do to try and be a bit better and keep going and let's see where we yeah, get I, to. I, just talking about human ethics, but Peter Singer, who's obviously a huge yeah. uh, influence in animal ethics as well, but I, I think he came to the to the idea of you give away 30% of your or salary, I think it was, or 30% of your income to, to charity to help people suffering infectious diseases and, and saving lives. Effectively. Yeah. But that, you know, Through effective of, altruism. And, mm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Toby Ord, I think, yeah. you know, gave away everything above 20,000 or maybe slightly adjusted that, an Oxford, an Oxford academic. At some point, you will, whatever your philosophical belief, you will come against some arbitrary line where you have to say, look, this is, my, the, this is the way I live and, yeah. you know, I just draw a line somewhere. And that's fine. You know, if, even if that's, I'm going to be a vegan but have milk in my tea or whatever it is, I, I, you know, that's, that's, you've done a great thing of coming so far from where you started. So I'm definitely not in for condemning people who don't go every step or who don't, who take a, a, a week off in the summer from veganism or whatever it is. I don't feel like it's a, the damnation is going to come down on you. And I think that's a good way of thinking both about that sort of broader effective altruism challenge, but also veganism and animal ethics, right? On the one hand, it can feel like quite a weight, an oppressive weight of an obligation to do better and you're never doing enough. But there's a better way of thinking about that, which is the enormous potential we have quite easily to do enormous good and to reduce suffering in a radical way. So I think that's quite a hopeful message to us to end on, right? Every, every single one of us has some power and has some influence and it's remarkably easy, never been easier to... Um, do some really good things. Yeah, I think we're just getting to, we're just trying to tip the system. The default lies somewhere else. So if we all put enough effort in now, then like, then the default in schools becomes vegetarian or vegan meals. Yeah. And then it's much harder to opt out of. Then we become comfortable. And the reason why it's difficult now to be a vegan or not to buy the most polluting cars or whatever it may be is because the system is set up differently. But we can share that. And I think part of the reason I'm hopeful is that as we do that and as the systems shift and as the alternatives become cheap, fast, easy, available, and are also less ethically damaging and less environmentally damaging, as those alternatives are there, whether it's plants or clean meat or electric cars, as those become pervasive and super easy and people switch to them just through default normal decisions, it frees us up to improve our ethics as well. Because as we talked about before, and it's quite hard to condemn a system that you're part of, same with smoking. But once you're out of it, it's quite easy to drive for it to you know, really change quickly. Yeah, I share your optimism that it can feel frustrating and all social change movements feel slow when you're in them, but change can happen very rapidly. We've, we've achieved it in a bunch of other domains already with still further to go. But yeah, it feels like we might be nearing a tipping point on this one too. So yeah. It's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so much for your book and your writing and also for, I think, reaching some radically different audiences as well, because there's a lot of people talking to 
uh, the converted within the vegan and animal advocacy movement. So to have the, the chief features editor of the Financial Times publishing books and writing in establishment papers like the FT, I think is deeply important and really helps to you know break the mold and get some new people thinking who might not have done so before. Thanks. I should say chief features writer, just in case some of my colleagues... Uh, Oops, think sorry. I, I, promoted myself. <laughs> I just promoted you. I, I, uh... But no, I've really, I, I really enjoy it. And, you know, the richness of writing on animal issues is incredible when you see the things that have been written. And I think that's one of the frustrating things that you can look back nearly 200 years and see many of the same arguments for vegetarianism as a yeah. made today, including the idea that, you know, it's wasteful to with land. You know, yeah. you just need far uh, more land to produce These animals. These are not new ideas, yeah. As, yeah, that's the slowness of change is the frustrating thing. But I feel even in my world of the FT, we now see articles on, on this kind of thing on a regular basis. Yeah, so becoming much more mainstream. And maybe you can work on the FT's editorial standards so that they and stop talking about non-human animals in terms of products and tonnage and re- respect their individual sentient yeah, moral value. What the FT is really good at is is not dictating a line from, yeah. from the top. And the first article I did on these kind of issues was actually, I was looking for an issue that no one else covered. So I, as a young journalist, could get some space in the magazine at the weekend. And I just, I I was told by a vet that just pets are living so long. It's a crazy thing in her surgery. And I wrote a piece about pets living longer. And that sort of got, slightly got me onto this path. So I'm, you know, grateful to the FT for giving me a kind of space to breathe with these topics. And now here we are writing about factory farming. Yeah. Brilliant. And what's the, so what's the best way of people finding your work in the FT, buying your book, following your thinking? I can yeah, include I'm, links in the show notes, of course, so don't worry about um, it. I'm very active on Twitter and Henry Mance on Twitter, and I try to mix the animal content with some political stuff and some funny stuff. Uh, and the book, which is called How to Love Animals in a Human-Shaped World, which is out now, I would love it if people picked it up because it's a journey I put a couple of years of my life into. I went to work in an abattoir, I went to work in a pig farm, and it did my best to answer questions that I think a lot of us uh, have struggled with over years. So I would love people to have a look at it and to get in touch with their thoughts. This is Luna. <laughs> talking, oh, yeah. of, talking of sentient. Oh, another Luna. Uh, how nice. Um, yeah, hello. yeah, aren't you gorgeous? She d- demands attention. So I had to say hello. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it, I, I haven't read the book yet, but I've read your articles and I'm looking forward to reading the book. It's a Oh, great. Um, I look forward to hearing what you think of it. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you so much for spending the time with me today. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you, Henry. Excellent. Thanks, Jamie. My pleasure.